Good morning, landlords. Uh, it's Matt from Christopher Shaw here with James Tiller, and uh, we're here today with Matt Robinson from SJL Insurance uh, to talk to you about uh, the various aspects of landlord um, insurance and the differences between each cover. Um, firstly, good morning, Matt. Thank you for joining us. Morning, guys. Thank you very much for having me. You're very welcome. Very welcome. I hope you keep them well. Uh, a bit like me, you're uh, home with the family still. I am indeed. Yeah, we're kind of we're in one of those fortunate industries where we can literally pick up with a laptop, a phone, and as long as all the internet works, we can still quote and all the rest of it. So even though I'm in what is essentially the broom cupboard in the house, I'm still doing my uh, still doing my daily job, as it were. Nice, nice, nice. So we're gonna we're gonna dive straight into some questions because um, I know this is uh, an often misunderstood topic um, on the various different covers. Uh, between insurance um, and I'm sure you'll enlighten myself and James on a few points as well um, so diving straight and I think James you're going to lead off with with some of the questions today yeah sure yeah so Matt um, what is the difference between home insurance and, and landlord insurance okay first of all in terms of um, what they are first of all they're, they're both different types of, of property insurance you hear various terms banded about within the industry property insurance burns insurance things like that they're kind of interchangeable some of them when you get to landlord insurance and home insurance they are two specific types of insurance and the main difference is is their intended purpose um, with home insurance um, the intended purpose of that is to insure a home a family home people that live in whether there is no sort of investment opportunity within there. People have bought it, they may have a mortgage, they may have bought it outright, but there's no sort of money being generated out of it. Don't get me wrong, people buy it, flip them, things like that. Um, whereas landlord insurance, it, the idea behind it is you're buying it and putting somebody else into that property who is in turn going to pay a rent and of course an income. Um, now from uh, different types of lines of insurance, home insurance is what's known as personal lines insurance, it's personal to you. Whereas landlord insurance comes under commercial lines, which is where SJL insurance specialise. Um, but it's in fairness to the intended use. Now, bring it more relevant to uh, the landlords watching this. Um, landlord insurance, the biggest difference is you have a liability towards those tenants. Um, unfortunately, you can't get rid of that liability as much as it would be nice to. Um, you can't do that. So there are going to be accidents that happen from time to time, um, slips, trips, things like that. The landlord is still liable for that property. Um, now, don't get me wrong, as I say, his actions may limit that liability down, but he is still liability. In the event of a claim, a landlord insurance will have a section of cover that will help defend that claim. So the landlord ultimately doesn't have to put their hand in their back pocket to pay out. Now, some of these payouts can go into the thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pounds, depending on what the, um, uh, what the accident was. Um, as well as the liability aspect, there's other um, parts of the policy that you'll see, things that's called a loss of rent, uh, which I think we'll come on to a little bit later. Um, you'll have your property owner's liability, you may have alternative accommodation, uh, section covers in there. These are all sections of covers, but generally speaking, the whole policy is designed around the activities a landlord will undertake in letting a property. That's really interesting, particularly about the, uh, the, the the liability or the public liability aspect of that, because that's something we get asked about about quite a lot. Um, but what about property insurance? Do I need? Do you need that? Um, it, it, it's a little bit difficult. It depends how deep your pockets are, I suppose. First of all, from a legal requirement point of view, there is no legal requirement to take out property insurance of, of any uh, shape or form. Um, in the UK, in terms of um, compulsory insurance, it's something called employer's liability insurance. So if you're a business, sole trader, you're employing anybody, uh, you have to have that insurance. And the second one is motor insurance. Those are the, t the two main ones. In terms of everything else, it's kind of up to you. Now, don't get me wrong, there will be situations whereby under contract you're expected to take property insurance your mortgage for example um, if you're on a buy to let your buy to let um, financer might it might insist that you have it so yeah. from that point of view for filling those contracts you 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 may need it um, but the other thing is is for the vast majority of people whether it be home insurance whether it be landlord insurance this asset that they're purchasing is probably going to be one of the most expensive assets that they own not always as i say depends how deep your pockets are i suppose um, but chances are it's going to be the most expensive asset that you have 
have. So insuring it, should things go wrong uh, in that property, it means you do have some protection in there. So it's well worth uh, looking at. Uh, I'll give you a few examples. Some of the average sort of uh, properties that we insure, uh, their rebuild or reinstatement value is probably around a couple of hundred thousand, 300,000, something like that. Um, I don't know many people in the case of a total loss who have got that sort of money just lying around to be able mm. to uh, refund, uh, rebuild their property. So in the event of a total loss, looking at one extreme end of the, the spectrum, um, the insurance should kick in um, and rebuild that property to the same state it was uh, before the, uh, the incident occurred. Just, just on that last point, where does that leave people that have got flats, for example? Um, would would that that would that be part of a a, a policy within a maintenance uh, maintenance um, agree maintenance contract with a, a, a management company? Um, how does it work for them? Yeah, you, usually you're you're absolutely correct. So um, the owner of a flat is normally a, a leaseholder. Um, of course, with that you do have a freeholder who owns the fabric of the building uh, or the whole unit, uh, depending how many units are in there. So the whole building, um, and it's their responsibility to ensure the block for want of a better word mm. so they'll ensure that entire building and all the units within that within that block um, and there will be various different covers they will normally include property owners liability in there so even if you're renting out the flat uh, to a tenant your property owners liability is normally included within that however it is definitely worth checking on that that policy if you are a leaseholder and you do have a flat exactly what you're covered for your management company or if you direct with the the freeholder for example or even if it's a management association um, should have a copy of that and it's well worth just double checking um, also as well um, for your own peace of mind seeing what that cover extends to it should cover sort of fixtures and fittings within the flat the one thing that it won't cover for are any contents that the flat that the landlord the leaseholder of the flat puts into that property um, they won't we an extension of the property owner owner's liability for those contents so if something goes wrong with those contents that the landlord has put in the property or the leaseholder should I say is put in the property and there is an injury of a result the landlord again is still responsible now what we can do here is we can put a specific policy in place uh, to cover those contents which extends that property owner's liability for those contents um, and this is where there can be a little bit of confusion in 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 the market where people say oh Oh, I've not got much contents in there. Well, it only takes one thing in there that you have left in, you've not thought about, it goes wrong and there's an injury and you do have a potential claim, which if there's no insurance in place, well, it's up to you to, uh, uh, to defend that claim or pay out as the, as, as the case may be. So just to put you on the spot very, very quickly there, sorry, James, I know you've got another question in a second. Could you give us an example of something that the landlord could put into a property? Are we talking about furnishing, um, yeah, things you- like that? Can literally be anything that the, the when the leaseholder um, obviously buys the property is going to take it off the um, you know the, the freeholder for example um, it can be absolutely anything in there anything from a, a kettle a curtain pole could fall down bedding um, yeah. sofa bedding things like that if there's an injury as a result of any any furnishing or any content that the landlord has put in there there is the potential and I do say potential uh, for a claim uh, to okay. uh, to come through. It's good to know. So um, what types of property do SJL cover? Um, what are the types of policies and things that you, that you, that you offer as well? Yeah, so there's, there's a whole range of, of covers and there's basically a solution to sort every uh, property owner. Now I say property owner because that covers a sort of a multitude of clients, I suppose. Um, within the property owner remit, we deal with people who deal with residential properties. So on one end of the spectrum, it could be um, somebody who is letting out a room on an Airbnb type basis. Obviously, other brands of letting are available, but it just gets the message across nice and simple. Um, that um, would come under, as I said before, the commercial lines. You're letting out a room, you're using your home as a, uh, an investment opportunity to generate an income. Um, not all insurers like that. Uh, situation so if you've got lodgers students living in your property letting out via you know airbnb type website um then that could fall into commercial um, insurance and a specialist type 
the most common thing that I think you guys will see would be the buy to let the residentials. Now mm -hmm. that doesn't matter whether the landlord is letting out one property or whether he's got an entire portfolio. There aren't uh, short, short hold tenancies or ASTs for short. Um, and those are what we call the buy to let landlords. Uh, the other end of the spectrum could be, as we've touched upon there, the entire blocks. They could be the freeholder of the block or have uh, several policies themselves. So that's for the residential aspect. And then we've got commercial property investors as well that we deal with. So exactly the same as the residential, but there is a commercial or business element in there. So that might be people who own pubs, for example. It could be that they own shops. It could be that they own a building with a cafe and a flat above. They rent out the flat via you guys, but the shops let to, you know, a, a florist, for example that will come under commercial uh, uh, property owners. Um, we can do mixed portfolios. So if the property investor is investing in part commercial, part residential, uh, that's absolutely fine. We deal with HMOs, um, deal with development properties. So properties that are being um, swapped over. So maybe they were bought as a commercial, being flipped to a residential or vice versa. Um, as I mentioned, blocks of flats, portfolios and mixed portfolios. And then we're looking at properties of non-standard construction as well. Um, so that could be your thatched, uh, your grade listed, obviously the intended uses we spoke to, uh, could be in a flood area, could be in a subsidence area, that kind of thing that we can look at options for. Cool. Well, we've spoken about lots of different types of uh, types of insurance. So is it possible to put them all in one package or do you have to get separate quotes for things like land or building insurance or rent guarantee insurance or all of those things? Do you, is it possible to package it up as one policy? When it comes to property insurance, there's a few things to consider with this. Um, first of all, it depends on the structure of um, who owns the property. Uh, there's a principal insurance called um, insurable interest. Um, in short, it does get quite complicated, but, to know, but in short, it's basically you have to have a financial interest in the thing that you're trying to insure. Uh, so for example, James, if uh, I tried to insure your car, I wouldn't be able to, I don't have any financial interest in, in that. Um, there are a few exceptions and exclusions, so I won't get into the complications, but that's the basic principle. So most landlords need to consider how they are insuring their properties. Now we're aware that a lot of landlords put properties into limited companies. Um, some landlords that I've come across have several limited companies, maybe they're in joint ventures with other partners, just need to be thinking how they're insuring that property. So for example, uh, James and Matt, if I went into business with you to own a property, if I own number one, Bournemouth Street with you, James, and I own number two, uh, Bournemouth Street with you, Matt, that would be two separate policies um, because we've got different um, uh, inter insurable interests in that. Uh, we'd be insuring it differently. So that's, yep. the, that's the first kind of thing. The other kind of thing depends on the best deal in terms of the portfolio that we're looking at in terms of the mixture of it. Um, where possible, we can try and do it under one policy, but it might actually work out more beneficial if the landlord were to split their policy into commercial and residential, for example. Um, so it does depend on a case by case basis, but what we'll always do is if somebody has a portfolio, regardless of whether it's mixed or just commercial or just residential, um, we'll take a holistic view of the whole lot um, and advise on what's the best option for that landlord obviously from a cover point of view but also as well from a price and premium point of view great that's good so leading on to the next question probably would sound more like it has come from from a client um, but if if i require landlord contents insurance and fixtures and fittings cover for my flat as the building is insured by a management company can you offer that type of cover Yes, absolutely. So what we'd look to do is, as I said before, we'd look to do it via extending the um, the property owner's liability via the fixtures and fitting uh, by the the content, sorry, um, with it within the flat. So ten grand, five grand, something like that, quite minimal in terms of the contents, but it does extend that uh, property owner's liability. Um, as an approximate price, you're probably looking around about 100 quid a year. So it's quite minimal, really, for that peace of mind, knowing that you've got everything covered in place. Um, as I said previously, it's well worth double checking the leaseholder of any flat um, with the management company, with the association, with the freeholder, regardless of who it is, exactly what you're covered for. Um, now, one thing that we have done as a company, 
company is uh, a lot of our landlords who own, uh, especially if they own several units within the same block, have actually, uh, have actually managed to send us a copy over of that policy and we've been able to advise where there's gaps in cover, for example. We've even had it where the situation whereby they put the freeholder in front of us and we've done them a quote and made them a saving. So hopefully that got filtered back down to the landlord and a, a reduction on his uh, ground rent or whatever. But uh, I suspect not as well, you can live but in hope. <laughs> there was the option there too. So yeah, so it's, it's well worth just double checking and engaging with the, uh, the property owner in terms of what you're actually covered for. Um, and if not, definitely come to us and we can, uh, we can look at options there. But it, it's relatively cheap, um, unless, you, as I say, you've got deep pockets and put gold bathrooms and gold kettles in there, then uh, I can't imagine the contents coming up to uh, a, a lot of money. No. Well, that leads nicely on to the next question. We talked about contents and obviously the, the value of those may not be astronomical, but obviously if we, we touch briefly on if a property burnt down, um, you know, how would a landlord work out the rebuild and reconstruction costs for an insurance quote? Yeah, this is this is quite a common question that we do get. Um, from our point of view, it's a little bit frustrating because as insurance brokers, that's our specialty. We're not surveyors, we're not RICs regulated or anything. So um, us providing um, rebuild valuations is something that unfortunately as insurance brokers, we can't do. Now, there's a couple of ways in which a landlord can go about this. The first way of doing it is they can obtain insurance, which is a what called a blanket cover. So, for example, it will insure um, all the properties or all the property yep. up to a certain amount, whether that be 250,000, 500,000, a million, depending on the policy. Um, they're a bit of a, a, a sort of a one size fits all, all if you like. Um, obviously, the advantage from a landlord's point of view is that obviously, if they think their property is going to be less than 500,000 to rebuild, if that's what the policy limits are, then they don't have to give any specific figures. However, with those policies there's always going to be ups and downs people are going to be have slightly lower rebuild values people slightly more and obviously there's an average uh, across the board when it comes to a pricing from an insurer's point of view um, the way that we work is we're trying to obtain a specific rebuild valuation um, to give a much more tailored uh, uh, quote to a landlord so they're not overpaying um, but equally they're not they're not underpaying it and um, the way that they can do that is in in several ways uh, first of all in Engage with uh, your own estate agent, uh, letting agent. A lot of letting agents will have a surveyor, for example, who they can work. And they might be able to give a range uh, as to what their um, what they think the reinstatement value would be. Now, we should probably point out that at this point, that the reinstatement value that we as insurers work off is different to the market value. Yeah, so I'm going to take gonna London, say. for example. If you've got a two-bed property in London, the value of it is probably going to be quite a lot higher than what it would be to reinstate the property. But the reinstatement value is what happens if you have a complete loss, and it's things like clearing the site after a total loss. Um, obviously, maybe road closures, for example, obviously labor costs to actually um, build the property, which do fluctuate materials costs, uh, do fluctuate to rebuild the property, um, obviously architects fees, etc. So it's not just a case of bricks and mortar and a bricky coming round. It's everything else that you need to consider as mm. well. So first and foremost, to answer your question, a surveyor, that's probably the best way of, of going about it in terms of getting the most accurate rebuild value uh, that will come round. Obviously, there's going to be a cost attached to that now if you've got commercial property it's well worth having a look on uh, uh, doing that for the sake of a couple of hundred quid um, every few years just have a rinse uh, uh, um, evaluation for insurance um, with residential property there are other tools if you don't want to go down the, that route there's something called the ABI rebuild calculator and I'll send you guys the link the ABI is the Association of British Insurers it's their rebuild calculator and essentially you log in you rent your email addresses it's free to use uh, you you enter the square foot or square meterage of the property and um, the condition of the property and it will give you a range uh, for example 200 to 230 so they're not giving you a specific figure they're giving you a range on that but it is accurate however if you're in any doubt or you're unsure engage the services of a qualified surveyor um, in the event of there being any problems obviously you've got a claim there on their professional indemnity insurance um, should they have undervalued the property for you and as a result has affected your insurance should there be a claim 
Fantastic. No, that's really in depth. Um, we're going to, we're going to finish off with this one. And this is a, this is one that often gets confused um, in terms of rent guarantee. Obviously it's a hot topic at the moment with everything that's going on and the, the increased vulnerability of, of jobs uh, and things like that. But obviously we can take rent guarantee insurance out at the beginning point of a tenancy, but let's say that that isn't the case. Um, they've got a tenant in there. It's been there a long time. What information would you need uh, as an insurer in regards to referencing of a tenant to uh, to qualify for rent guarantee insurance for yourselves? Yeah, it's an interesting point. We are seeing a number of uh, landlords come to us inquiring, especially since the uh, COVID-19 outbreak mm. um, of looking to insure their properties. Um, the idea behind rent guarantee insurance is it's, uh, it's away from the buildings and contents. We're not insuring the buildings and contents here. We're insuring the tenancy, the AST, the contract that is in place. That's the thing that we're insuring. So actually, from an insurable interest point of view, there's a couple of interesting points on that. First of all, obviously, the property owner they have insurable interest in the tenancy as the principal of that contract. But also potentially the agents could have insurable interest in that as well, especially if it's managed, uh, which is why you see a number of letting agents have the ability to take out rent guarantee policies as part of their managed service. Um, we can get into that all day. I can be here all day. I can do another video on that. That's absolutely fine. Um, but um, in terms of taking out a policy sort of midterm, um, what you will find is there will be claims exclusions if the tenancy has started before the insurance policy. Uh, and the reason for that is to stop landlords and letting agents realizing they ooh, might have a bit of a problem here and sort of passing the book to insurers to pay out. It's just to prevent that. So if the tenancy has already started before the insurance, you'll probably find there's a claims exclusion period of 90 days before yeah. you can start to make a claim on, on, on that, that policy. Um, in terms of what do we need? Um, well, referencing from a uh, reputable provider, uh, there are many out there. Um, but ways we were looking for is that they're past reference, so clear of any adverse data, CCJs, court decrees, bankruptcies. Um, they're referenced against their appropriate rent share. So, for example, if it's a family living in the property, um, mom, dad, two kids, both kids under 18, the rent share, obviously under 18s can't go on the AST. Um, so, uh, under that, the rent share would be 50-50 between the the parents in that property you what you can't really have is sort of a lead tenant it should be on the appropriate rent share as to say um then that they can afford the property so they've got an appropriate income to cover their rent share and if applicable um there is a land previous landlord reference yeah i mean these these are kind of standard you know the prop rent was already always paid on time yeah, stand, fairly standard, what we call... Yeah, standard referencing. I think what we're finding is post-fee ban, I think we're finding that more and more so, a lot of people are looking to reduce their costs, understandably so, and are maybe just looking to do very basic referencing, like a credit check. Um, so just to clarify that that's not going to be enough should they want to take a policy out later. Yeah, that's correct. It used to be the case that there are a lot of uh, rent guarantee companies with their USP said they take it on basic referencing. Uh, before the fee ban, it was going out to the market. But now I must be honest, I'm not aware of anybody yeah. that does basic reference. It has to be that comprehensive full landlord check and obviously employment check that they can afford the property at the outset of the, uh, the tenancy. Yeah. Can I just ask one last question before we finish up, um, Matt? So going back to the contents insurance again, is there a point where landlord contents insurance, tenant contents insurance, building contents insurance, is there a point where they all conflict with each other or are they just in a big circle together representing their own interests? Um, no, they do represent their own interests. Remember the insurable interest in what we're doing. The way that they can conflict and it can get a bit confusing um, is who's responsible for what in terms of a claim. Mm. So um, let's say you use the scenario, you've got a let property, um, professional couple in there, etc., etc. Now the landlord may have left that property furnished and obviously he's got responsible for that. But also the tenants as well have a responsibility for keeping that property and its furnishings um, in good order less fair wear and tear, et cetera, et cetera. So for example, if a tenant were to spill a bottle of red wine on the carpet, 
that is the tenant's responsibility to put right. Now, obviously, they could, you know, rely. On, they could do it themselves, get the, the, the carpet replaced or cleaned themselves. Uh, they could rely on their deposit, depending on how they've done it. Or the final option is the tenants can take out what's called tenant uh, insurance for tenants' liability. Now, what you tend to find is this kind of packaged up into a full tenant contents uh, policy, but it will include a tenant's liability, and this is for accidental damage towards the landlord's fixtures and fittings that they've left in the property. Um, and, and of course, contents as well. So it's the word is obviously accidental, but it's you're not you're doing this maliciously. Um, uh, but it will it will kick in and pay out. And there's various different policy types there. So yeah, it's at the claim stage that things can get a little bit interesting and who's responsible for what and what the situation was to um, to bring the claim about. And everything is taken on a case by case basis, unfortunately. <laughs> You're just following on from that, um, give your student properties as an example, um, higher risk, higher fire risk in particular, um, come with a lot more regulation. We've had it in a, uh, not our properties, but in the local press, there has been a couple of um, student properties which have caught fire as a result of accidents by the tenants. Obviously, we talked about mandatory insurance and insurance that you have to take out. Um, obviously, we would recommend to tenants to take out contents insurance. But if they didn't and they accidentally set fire to a house with a candle or something to that, that point, where does that leave the landlord? Would, would their insurance supersede um, the tenant's own accident? Um, you know, would, the, would their policy potentially cover or can they take out a policy that would cover the property in the event of a tenant accident? Um, well, first of all, in terms of a fire, uh, for example, or, or storm or flood or anything, um, student or not, um, all properties are susceptible to those, uh, those, those perils. So if the uh, property did catch fire, whether it be accidental or not, um, the fire peril will be activated and the landlord's insurance should kick in okay. and, and, and put that right. Um, getting into complications there in terms of who's responsible, and it does get to a bit of a... Um, I wouldn't necessarily say a blame game, but you want to establish who that uh, who is responsible, and if obviously if there's um, uh, recourse for that to claim money back, uh, especially if it's malicious, etc., criminal, um, then obviously there's going to be uh, potential repercussions there. Um, but to keep it quite simple, no, the landlord's insurance should kick in um, and pay for that claim to be re to, for the property to be reinstated, for example, assuming it's insured on the correct basis. Um, interestingly, you mentioned about uh, the bigger the fire risk HMO insurance um, have some multiple occupa occupation um, which is where you tend to find a lot of students live especially in their second third years and beyond yeah. um, it's still landlord insurance it's still building insurance of specific type but it's well worth speaking to a specific provider um, who specializes in this um, again not all landlord insurance cater for HMO um, in the same way that not all um, uh, insurers like you know the Airbnb type uh, lets as well so again it's well worth speaking to a specialist provider for HMOs. Fantastic well look, I think that wraps it up perfectly what we will do then Matt is we will put your details below um, which will uh, which will uh, be an email direct to yourself so I'm sure if any of our landlords have questions or want to get some policy um, cover put in place uh, or just see if you know you can offer them something better than what they've currently got. I know um, you managed to save one of our landlords um, some money last week. Um, so yeah, uh, we would recommend anyone to reach out and just check A, their policy is covering exactly what it should. Um, and two, you may you know uh, look to make some savings. Um, you may not if you want to obviously ensure absolutely everything. But yeah, we, thank you for dropping into this video. And um, if anyone's got any questions or follow-ups, we'll, we'll pop them across to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Cheers, thank Cheers, you. Matt. Thanks a lot, take care.